Welcome to the Booking Holdings First Quarter 2020 Conference Call. Booking Holdings would like to remind everyone that this call may contain forward-looking statements, which are made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements are not guaranteed of future performance and are subject to certain risks, uncertainties, and assumptions that are difficult to predict. Therefore, actual results may differ materially from those expressed, implied, or forecasted in any such forward-looking statements. Expressions of future goals or expectations and similar expressions reflecting something other than historical fact are intended to identify forward-looking statements. For a list of factors that could cause booking holdings actual results to differ materially from those described in the forward-looking statement. Please refer to the safe harbor statements at the end of the booking holdings, earnings press release, as well as booking holdings, most recent filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Unless required by law, booking holdings undertakes no obligation to update publicly any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. A copy of Booking Holdings Earnings release, Press Release, together with an accompanying financial and statistical supplement, is available in the For Investors section of Booking Holdings website, www.bookingholdings.com. And now, I'd like to introduce Booking Holdings speakers for this afternoon, Glenn Fogel and David Goulden. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome to Booking Holdings' first quarter conference call. I am joined this afternoon by our CFO, David Goulden. We are living in difficult times. Since our last call in February, the spread of COVID-19 has grown exponentially, bringing uncertainty, turmoil, and to too many people, tragedy all over the world. What started as a regional outbreak that we had hoped would be contained would follow the paths of other new viruses like SARS or H1N1, has grown into a global pandemic of unprecedented proportions. We join the global community in our sadness at this horrific suffering and loss of life and recognize the tremendous economic toll on so many people in so many countries. This virus has wrecked havoc on industries across the world, and this is, without a doubt, the biggest disruption modern global travel the world has ever seen. Billions of people have been under stay-at-home orders, and there have been and continue to be closures of borders, government-enforced travel restrictions, and strict guidelines regarding social distancing. These actions have profoundly affected our industry in every corner of this earth. While our Q1 reported room nights declined 43% year-over-year, we did not see the virus's full negative force on our business until mid to late March. So the 43% decline does not truly reflect the state of our business nor the travel industry today. In March, our reported room nights declined over 100%, meaning we received more cancellations during that month than new bookings. Looking at things a different way, our newly booked room nights, which exclude the impact of cancellations, we're down over 60% year over year in March and down over 85% in April. This gives you a clear indication of how much our business is currently impacted by this crisis. That being said, while the virus's impact on travel is unprecedented, I am confident that this crisis will eventually end and people will travel again. Travel is fundamental to who we are. And while it may take some time to return to pre-COVID-19 levels, we will get there eventually, and then we'd expect travel to continue to grow thereafter. So what are we doing now as we wait for effective treatments or a successful vaccine? During the first quarter, when it became clear that the virus impact was going to be more significant than anyone initially anticipated, we quickly developed a series of plans to help us navigate through these challenging times. One, stabilize the business from the immediate shock of the crisis. Two, optimize the business for the expected decrease in travel demand over the next few years, and three, position the business to capture travel demand when it returns so we can emerge from this crisis on strong footing and extend our leadership position. 
As we entered the stabilization phase at the beginning of the crisis, our employees' health and safety was a top priority. Although we have, although we have a few offices currently open in Asia, the vast majority of our employees are now working from home including our customer service teams, which is no small accomplishment considering the technology requirements and the huge increase in change requests and cancellations that we experienced. I am very proud of our teams and pleased to say that we are functioning well in this new distributed environment. Another immediate priority was helping our customers and our supply partners. For a number of weeks, we were fielding a significantly higher number of daily inbound calls than we typically received. For our customers, this entailed supporting them as they sought refunds for bookings that were no longer possible due to government regulations or made requests to modify their travel plans. For our partners, many of whom do not have the ability to process such a large volume of customer service calls, we supported them by handling the unprecedented level of cancellations and date modifications requests. Looking ahead, We'll be working with our travel partners to create plans to stimulate travelers to book again once this crisis is behind us. We know how critical it will be to bring demand to our supply partners in a cost-effective way. Also, as part of our stabilization plan, we took immediate steps to conserve cash and increase liquidity, such as halting stop buybacks, dramatically reducing marketing spend worldwide, cutting non-essential costs, implementing a general hiring freeze, and reducing executive compensation with our brand CEOs and I foregoing salaries during this crisis and the other senior managers throughout the company voluntarily reducing their base salaries and our board of directors foregoing their cash fees. In addition to reducing costs, we bolstered our liquidity by raising over $4 billion in debt. These measures have enabled us to have sufficient liquidity to weather a long period of significantly reduced travel demand and to have the necessary resources to invest in securing demand when people are ready to travel again. We've now begun to refine and execute our optimized plan in which we will adapt to the new reality that assumes it will be likely be years, not quarters, before we witness a full recovery of global travel demand. We believe that either a vaccine or effective treatment is needed before people will feel fully comfortable traveling the way they did before the pandemic started. And even after a vaccine or treatment is declared safe and effective, we believe it may be some time before there is sufficient quantity and distribution of them to give people and governments confidence for people to travel freely. Furthermore, as in pre-COVID-19 days, travel will be dependent on the overall economy, consumers' financial health after having gone through a very deep recession, and consumers' confidence in their own economic futures. For these reasons, we expect travel to fully recover later than many other industries. However, when travel demand does start to recover, we believe there will be attractive growth opportunities. We are in the process of assessing the cost structure of our entire company and developing plans to align it with expected market demand. As part of these efforts, we're also evaluating our strategic initiatives and the timing of significant expenditures. We intend to continue to invest in our key projects such as payments and the connected trip that we believe will position us well for the future. But we are also re-examining all areas of the company to see where can we reduce or delay costs where possible. Fortunately, our financial, our financial strength allows us to make strategic decisions oriented towards the long-term interests of the business. We recently completed a strategic evaluation at Open Table and Kayak, announcing last week a series of actions to reduce operating costs. Unfortunately, this included the decision to lay off and furlough some employees. As a principle during this crisis, we have not reached first for employee reductions to lower costs. But after making adjustments in other operating expense areas, we made the tough decision to ensure the size and scope of our business is proportionate to the new realities of the travel market. We are now working with the other brands to examine their cost structures, and we will be thoughtful and deliberate in our evaluations. In an attempt to minimize the impact on our employees during these difficult times, we have been evaluating and employing various governmental financial support programs. Booking.com recently announced that it would participate in the employee aid program offered by the United Kingdom 
and we were able to place employees on furlough there, which has enabled employees to receive a significant portion of their full-time salary. We have also applied to the Dutch government to obtain aid under their recently enacted program to support employment in the Netherlands. This program provides funds to Dutch companies impacted by this crisis and covers a portion of employee salaries for a three-month period with the requirement that companies which receive this aid maintain employment during the time the aid is provided. These programs, along with all the other steps we have taken, will help us support employees and maintain jobs as we continue to fully evaluate the operating environment. We will continue to look at other available options that might help us mitigate near-term headcount reductions during this period of significantly reduced revenue. The actions we are taking in our stabilization and optimization phases are being done so that we can capitalize quickly and efficiently on travel demand when it becomes safe for people to travel again. We want to emerge from this crisis as a strong organization that is equipped to deliver for our customers and our partners, will capitalize, and in a position to increase our market share when the world is ready to travel again. On a smaller but somewhat positive note, we are seeing some stability in our newly booked room night growth trends. We hope that this is the beginning of the road back to recovery, but it is simply too early to say with certainty. Some governments have seen progress in limiting or reducing the pandemic. They have slowly begun to reopen their economies, and we have seen new bookings primarily for domestic travel, although still at very low levels. Some, or many of these reservations, may ultimately be canceled but we believe it does show that travel for essential business and personal reasons will slowly return as society makes progress against the pandemic. And as travel returns, we expect to see improvement in our revenue. We are also prepared for disruption in that progress as relaxation of social distancing in some geographies may lead to a resurgence of infections and reinstatement of government restrictions. Our aim is to optimize the business to participate in the ultimate return of demand. Please continue, sir. Hello? Go ahead, sir. Hello? Hello, am I still on the line? Yes, one moment, please. Thank you. Hello, operator, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, am I live on the line? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and good afternoon. Uh, operator, am I live on the line? Can you confirm that, please? I yes, can, you uh, are, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, good afternoon. Our review, our offering results for the first quarter, discussed our stabilization initiative to bolster our liquidity and provide some color on trends we saw in April. All growth rates are relative to the prior year comparable period unless otherwise indicated. Information regarding reconciliation of non-gap to gap can be found in our earnings release. Now on to our results of the quarter. At the time of our last earnings call on February 26, the outbreak of COVID-19 was largely contained to Asia, and we yet to see a meaningful impact in our business across Europe or North America. As we moved into March, the COVID outbreak continued to spread throughout Europe and North America, leading to the eventual declaration of a global pandemic and the implementation of numerous travel restrictions and shelter-in-place orders. Not surprisingly, we saw a resulting sharp deterioration of our top-line trends in March with significant levels of cancellations and a substantial reduction in the level of new bookings. Although we only felt the full brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic around mid to late March, our Q1 results were still significantly negatively impacted. Our Q1 reported room nights declined 43% for the full quarter. However, that decline exceeded 100% in March as we received more cancellations than new bookings in the month. Our cancellation rate peaked in mid-March 
and has been steadily improving since then as we work through the wave of cancellation of bookings made prior to the imposition of restrictions on travel. Gross bookings declined 51% in Q1, which is a greater decline than reported room nights due to average daily rates for accommodation decreasing about 15% year on year on a constant currency basis. Consolidated non-GAAP revenue for the first quarter was $2.3 billion and decreased 21% year on year. Revenue in the quarter was less negatively impacted than room nights and gross bookings due to the fact that many cancellations were received in Q1 were for check-ins that were, were expected to occur later in, in uh, were expected to occur in later quarters. Adjusted Q1 for EBITDA was $290 million, which was down 60% year on year. We benefit from having a highly variable cost structure that naturally declines in periods of lower travel demand. As Glenn noted, we are taking further actions in reducing other areas of spend as we stabilize and then move to optimize and align our cost structure with the new demand environments. With that being said, there are some areas of, exp- of, of expense pressure in the quarter related to COVID-19 pandemic that I'll walk you through. Marketing expense, which is a highly variable expense, decreased 29% year on year as we saw a significant reduction in demand in the paid channels. In addition, we took actions to substantially reduce our brand marketing spend in response to the diminished travel demand environment. We expect our marketing expense will remain significantly below 2019 levels for the remainder of the year. Sales and other expenses increased 75% year on year due primarily to a $183 million increase in provisions for expected bad debt and other credit losses resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Excluding the impact of the increased provision we recorded in the quarter, sales and other decreased 10% year on year, as this, as this expense line is substantially variable in nature. For example, we recorded lower expenses associated with payments in Q1. This reduction was partially offset by higher outsourced customer service costs as we worked through the heavy volume of cancellations we received in the quarter. Personnel expense decreased 3% year over year, primarily due to decrease in stock-based compensation which was impacted by reduced financial performance as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Excluding SBC expenses, personnel increased 12% year over year. And although we have implemented a hiring freeze, personnel expense this quarter was impacted by annualized hires that were made last year. We expect the pressure on personnel expense will diminish as we move through the year. G&A expenses increased 6% year over year, largely driven by higher indirect taxes, including digital service taxes. Excluding these indirect taxes, G&A expense decreased 7% year over year as we reduced discretionary expenses such as T&A expense. We will see less year over year pressure on G&A from digital service taxes once we lap the enactment of the French DST, which occurred in Q3 of last year. Finally, information technology expenses increased 20% year on year driven by higher software fees and outsourced data center and cloud costs. On a GAAP basis, we incurred an operating loss of $308 million as our GAAP operating expenses in the quarter included charge of $489 million related to an impairment of goodwill for Open Table and Kayak. This impairment charge is driven by, re- by reduced financial projections as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We excluded the impairment of goodwill from our non-GAAP results. Our Q1 GAAP net loss was $699 million. Our Q1 GAAP net loss includes $307 million of pre-tax losses on our equity investments in Trip.com and Metuan and the $100 million impairment charge related to our strategic investments. This was partially offset by $33 million of FX remeasurement gains on our euro bonds. We excluded these unrealized losses, impairment charge, and remeasurement gains from our non-GAAP results. Now on to our cash and liquidity position. Our Q1 ending cash and investment balance was $9.2 billion, which decreased from our December ending balance of $11.8 billion due to several factors, including the following primary drivers. First, we had $380 million of operating cash outflow in the quarter, which was driven by an $820 million use of cash due to change in working capital, as well as the lower earnings we generated in the quarter. Working capital in Q1 was negatively was negatively impacted by a prepayment of taxes in the Netherlands of $719 million, $717 million that was subsequently refunded in April. The large reductions in our deferred motion bookings, accounts payable and accrued expenses balances 
were mostly offset by the significant reduction in our accounts receivable balance in Q1. The deferred merchant booking reduction was driven by both lower bookings and customer refunds. We expect these balances will all continue to decline in the low level bookings we're currently seeing in the business. Second, we repurchased $1.3 billion of our stock in Q1, almost all of which was purchased under a stock buyback plan we filed last November. We halted buybacks as soon as we recognized the growing impact of the pandemic. Third, we had CapEx of $80 million in the quarter. And finally, the value of our investments declined in part by the $307 million unrealized loss on equity securities and the $100 million impairments related to a strategic investment that I mentioned earlier. In addition, we had a $106 million decline in investment value that did not impact the P&L, but was reflected in the balance sheet. The majority of the remaining $288 million difference between cash and investments at year end of March 31st is primarily due to the timing of the settlement of sales of some corporate bonds that were classified in prepaid expenses and other assets at the end of March. These sales were settled in April and moved into cash and investments. In our efforts to stabilize the business from the immediate shock of the crisis, we've taken several steps to shore up and bolster our liquidity position. We halted repurchases of our stock, and we'll not initiate repurchases until we have better visibility into the shape and timing of a recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. We worked to receive a refund in April of the prepayment of taxes in the Netherlands that was made early in Q1. We amended our revolving credit facility to substitute a minimum liquidity covenant for the previous leverage covenant through June of 21 to ensure we continue to have access to this source of liquidity. And finally, and most notably, we completed a bond and convertible note offering on April 8th that raised $4.1 billion of capital. If you adjust our March 31 ending cash investment balance of $9.2 billion for our bond and convertible note offering and the settlement of the corporate bond sales and the refund of the Dutch tax prepayment, all of which occurred in April, our March 31 cash and investment balance would, it would increase to about $14.3 billion. Approximately $12 billion of this is highly liquid after considering the actions we've taken, including recently completing the sale of our trip.com ADSs, and moving on cash and investments into corporate and moving on cash and investments in corporate bonds into AAA Treasury and government money market funds. After the bond and convertible offering, we have about $13 billion of debt. $4 billion of which matures before the end of 2022. Due to the COVID-19 crisis, I will not provide quarterly guidance like we normally do. However, I will provide some color from our preliminary April results, which will give you a clear picture of our recent top-line trends, considering that April was the first month fully impacted by the pandemic. As Glenn mentioned, our newly booked room nights in April were down, were down over 85% year-on-year. As a reminder, newly booked room nights exclude the impact of cancellations. Of course, these new bookings may be canceled in the future, especially as a very high percentage of new bookings in April were made with flexible cancellation policies. Reported room nights continue to be negative in April as cancellations outpace new bookings. We expect our revenue in April to have a greater year-on-year -year decline than newly booked room nights considering the impact of the cancellations in March for April stays, and also since many hotels, especially in Europe, were not open in April. New bookings and revenue for full second quarter may vary from April's results, depending upon the level of travel demand and accommodation availability we've experienced in May and June. Now, as Glenn noted, we're seeing some stability in our newly booked room night growth trends, with the year-on-year -year decline rate being quite consistent throughout April after reducing rapidly through the first quarter. We believe that domestic travel will rebound sooner than international travel as we expect travelers to look to their home country or region first for a safe travel option. In April, we, we witnessed a meaningfully higher domestic mix in our business. Historically, domestic accommodation bookings represent about 45% of Booking.com's total business. And if we consider Western Europe as one market, the historic mix increases to about 55%. In April, Booking.com's domestic share increased to approximately 70%. And if you consider Western Europe as one market, the domestic mix increased to over 75%. Towards the end of April, 
we saw some very early indications that domestic travel was starting to return in certain markets where shelter-in-place rules were relaxed, including Greater China, South Korea, Vietnam, and Germany. Newly booked, right, newly booked room nights in the U.S. declined less than our global average in April, and we saw an improvement in domestic travel during April, but we cannot tie this to the relaxing of shelter-in-place rules, as these have only happened in, in a few states and in recent days. I must emphasize again that it's too early to say we're witnessing anything like a broad rebound in travel, especially as we've seen some countries like Singapore where travel demand was less impacted than other places initially, but is now seeing significant travel demand decreases associated with, it, with new outbreaks. If we look across all our business, the rate, the decline rate for newly booked room nights in the last few days in April was only a few percent better than the decline rate in the first few days. We've also observed a meaningful change in Booking.com's customer booking behavior. In April, their customers mainly booked either very very close to stay or several months out. The combined mix of both very short booking and bookings for over two months' time is twice the normal amount. This booking behavior change has also been accompanied by an increase in mobile bookings, particularly in our app helping drive a higher mix of direct bookings, and we'll continue to focus on providing our customers with a great app experience. As Len emphasized, we have a tough road ahead of us as we look to navigate through the unprecedented challenges that COVID-19 has presented to us. We're working hard to stabilize our business through actions including our cost savings initiatives and a significant bolstering of our liquidity position. We'll continue to optimize our business and our costs to align with expected market demand and we'll work to position ourselves to capitalize upon the reemergence of travel demand when that time occurs and wherever that demand occurs. We have the confidence that through these actions, we'll be well positioned to come out of this crisis and extend our global leadership role in the travel marketplace. With that, we will take your questions. And David, can you hear me? I can hear you now, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. At this time to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is for one to ask your question. The first response is from Mark Mahaney, RBC Capital. Please go ahead. Um, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll try two questions. First, uh, uh, David, I think at the end you talked about this increase in app bookings, so a rise in direct bookings. Is, uh, is that something you actually uh, were able to drive? Did that just happen um, randomly? And is there, um, is there a way that, co that coming out of this crisis that – at the margin, you can tilt more of your bookings to it can accelerate this transition to direct bookings. And then secondly, thanks for the data points on the uh, improvements in a couple of the markets. Any quantification uh, on those? Is there any way to say that any of these markets, South Korea, Vietnam, whatever, are back at, you know, down 50% or something like that? Like what's the, what, can, you, can you kind of draw the curve a little bit if, if it, or if maybe too early? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Mark, thank you. This is David. I'll take that. Um, let me go with the second question first. Um, we have called out markets where there's been a double-digit improvement in the, in the rate of decline uh, from the uh, start of April to the end of April. And we really, we really only account, kept our, marks, our remarks through the month of April because you know, early trends in May are too early to, to, to call. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how much they're down. I mentioned to you that in total, even with this improvement we've seen in these markets, our uh, all-in room like. Uh, decline rate is only a few points better um, at the end of the month than it was at the start. But the markets that we called out have seen double-digit improvements uh, during the course of the month of April. Um, in terms of the shift towards app, first of all, I just caveat, as I said before, um, anything that we talk about in terms of, in terms of April when we're running it's kind of 10 to 15 percent of our normal volumes, you have to take and qualify through that lens and try not to draw too big a trend from it. Um, we did see during the course of the month that uh, we saw more app customers, we saw more genius customers, which is often tied to app use as well. And um, we're pleased the fact that in the areas we saw some demand increase or we saw the residual demand occur, more of it was going into the app. Uh, we'll continue to try and emphasize the app as we come through this because we want to make sure that we drive more direct business. And of course, the app is one of the strongest ways to drive direct business. But I wouldn't say there was a particular strategy that drove us there. Um, I'm pleased that that's the way that things came out, and we're going to continue to understand how our customers are buying and try and continue that trend as demand starts to recover. 
Thank you, David. Thank you, Glenn. Wishing you both the best. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Your next response is from Kevin Kaufman Cohen. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks so much. I I just wanted to to dig into the um, the cost trends that that. Uh, that you're seeing in April and also what you're planning for going forward. So could you help us think about that? Maybe starting with advertising, um, how that might trend relative to that new bookings metric and then and then moving on to uh to personnel and and uh your other big um chunks of expenses, what you're planning for there. Thanks. Uh David, why don't you take yeah, yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh thank you, Lenny. Yeah, let, let let me take that. So um marketing expenses are gonna correlate quite closely to the uh, rate of newly booked room nights. So you can uh, assume a close correlation there. Um, I actually walked through a number of these in the prepared remarks to Q1, Q2, but just to summarize, um, sales and other, obviously a, a piece of that is, uh, a large piece of that is tied to, to our merchant platform, and that is variable with volume, but things like uh, customer service costs and bad debts, as you saw, was a major factor in Q1. Those may continue to be a factor in uh, Q2. Um, next biggest area, of course, is personnel. And as we mentioned, uh, the the, uh, the hiring freeze and the other actions that we took uh, did not have much of an impact in Q1. In Q2, you'll get the full impact of those. Also, to the extent that we are successful with our application for government aid, that would uh, generally help Q2. And some of the optimization actions that we've already taken, like Kayak and Open Table, uh, will also help um, Q2. So as we move through the year, and continue with optimization activities, uh, that will also help with personnel expenses we, we, we move through the year, although uh, the government aid programs will be mainly focused upon Q2 and not the second half. Um, as I mentioned, uh, pressure will decrease on, on, on G&A, uh, particularly as we start to uh, lap the uh, DST expenses uh, last year. And uh, you know, information technology is uh, an interesting line. We saw obviously a fair amount of pressure on that in Q1, I point out that some of those costs relate to our volumes, and even though our revenues were basically not very high in Q1, the volumes that we had to process through the business, through refunds and cancellations, et cetera, were also high, and that drove uh, IT costs up. That was one of the factors. We expected there to be less pressure on that line going through the rest of the year. Thanks, and then if I could just ask one quick follow-up. Can you um, talk about how successful you've been in uh, getting refunds out to customers who have had to cancel and, and also helping them coordinate refunds um, when they're dealing with the hotels? Yeah, well, Glenn, take one. Yeah. So, you know, this is a difficult uh, issue. We have customers who have uh, purchased uh, reservations far in the future, perhaps, that were non-refundable. And then there was a case of uh, a pandemic and there's a force majeure situation we have a situation where the customer says, well, I can't travel because the government has said that you cannot travel there. And we have hoteliers who are saying, wait, I, I can't refund everybody. I may have even spent the money here, and it's a difficult situation. So we always believe in trying to do what is best for the customers, and our contracts with our hoteliers is completely set up for this exact situation, a force majeure situation, in which case, and it goes over a long history of travel, that in a situation like this, the hotel should refund the customer. So what we'll do is we will provide the monies to the customer and recover from the hotel. Now, we've talked about that there is an issue. You know, many of these hotels are closed right now. There's nobody actually there to have discussions with. You know, we hope to get a significant portion over, but we don't know yet if you're not talking with the people. And we always want to come up with a good relationship with the hotel. So as they reopen, as things start again, we want to do this in the best way possible. Um, I don't think we have any specific numbers to give. David has put in the reserves, and I think that's a, we hope for the best going forward. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, David. Thank you, Thank you Kevin. Thank you. Your next response is from Naveed Khan of SunTrust. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, just a couple of questions. So in the, uh, in the new bookings that are coming in, are you seeing any kind of uh, – uh, a pattern in terms of people, more people opting for maybe alternative lodging versus a hotel or vice versa. And then, uh, you know, in terms of just the uh, the fixed cost, I think, David, you gave us a sense of where these were on the on your Q4 call. I think you said less than 50% of the OPEX. And after the, you know, the, the initiatives that you're taking, 
that you've taken or will take. Give us some, give us some sense of where these could land ultimately. Yeah, no, it, um, on, the, on the new bookings, I mentioned the fact that we're seeing a bit of a, what I call a dumbbell in the cap pattern, which means that they're either very close to uh, the current stay or they're a long way out. Um, what happened in the first quarter is um, hotel and alternative performed about the same. So they basically were almost uh, um, uh, in lockstep from a growth point of view throughout the quarter. In April, we saw a shift to uh, alternative associated with those longer term bookings. So we saw alternative accommodations doing better um, in, in the April bookings, particularly at the far end of the dumbbell, which is the two month plus out uh, bookings, uh, particularly in the domestic markets where we saw some you know, decent return rates in the domestic markets in the month of, of April. So um, that's what we saw relative to the mix. Um, on the fixed costs, we are still, as Glenn said, I think he went through a fair amount of detail in his commentary, we are still building our optimized plans for many parts of the business. We've really only uh, put those in place yet uh, in one of our business segments, and we're working through the other business segments as we, as we speak. And, of course, uh, the timing of that is also going to be tied to what we're doing around some of the government aid programs. So I don't want to uh, come up with, with a number just yet. Uh, I'll give you a data point, for example, that the – um, the reductions that we took at uh, kind of open table reduced the personnel and office expenses there by about 20%. And those will be part of that uh, fixed or semi-fixed cost base we talked about. That's one example. Beyond that, I really don't want to go into any more details. We haven't finalized our plans yet, but as we do and when we do, we'll let you know what we expect them to do to our cost base. Got it. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Your next response is from Brian Nowak of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Alex Wong on for Brian. Thanks for taking the question. Um, just two questions. Uh, one, Glenn, you talked about sort of positioning the business to uh, become stronger. Can you talk to us a little bit how you think about new strategies or approach in the U.S. market specifically coming out of the downturn? Um, and then the second question, just Given the stay-at-home dynamics and with strong social media use, do you see an opportunity to potentially use more social averaging, uh, social advertising to drive growth coming out of the downturn? Thanks, Alex. It's, a, it's very important for us as we come out as optimized to make sure that we're doing everything we can to become a better competitor in the U.S. You know, we've talked in the past that we believe we under-index in the U.S., and that is something that is important to counter and, and be able to do. One of the things that we believe is providing a better overall value proposition to the customers. But it's also, as we talked in the past, is making our customers more or potential customers aware of this better uh, value proposition. And that goes through the connected trip that we've talked about in the past and how important we think that we'll be able to provide something different and better to the consumer. But your point is a good one about social media and how do we get that message to those consumers. And with our uh, CMO came from Google, uh, who has been here about 10 months now, we absolutely believe that uh, the social area, social media is a way to try and drive that message to the consumer. And we will be doing things in the future, albeit always looking what's the right ROI for that. It, it, it does us no good to waste uh, advertising money. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Your next response is from Lloyd Walmsley of Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Two questions, if I can. First, can you just talk about how you see the P&L coming out of this? And, and specifically, do you think that performance marketing can structurally benefit, perhaps, from lower competition in advertising auctions? Um, and then secondly, you know, Wondering, you know, if you're seeing any shift between kind of urban and more ski and beach type of locations in April bookings, and, and given, you know, somewhat of a shift to alternative, you know, give us an update on how you feel about your, your whole home inventory position as people perhaps look to locations with, with less urban density. Thanks. All right. Well, let me, let me start with the, the second one first about um, – the nature of the uh, where's the demand going in April and, and such. And I can't give you any more specifics and beyond what we've already described to a slight increase in people 
uh, going for the alternative accommodations over home. Um, I, I can say, though, there's not a lot of skiing in April, so that one, that one I can't tell you. Um, and, and remind me, your, your first question was? First question was, do you see, how do you see the P&L coming out of this, and then might there be some longer-term structural benefits from lower competition in, in advertising auctions? Yeah, so one of the things that I think is important to understand, well, we do believe that certainly because of this uh, pandemic, some of the smaller players in the industry are going to have trouble uh, going forward. But the big players are still going to be around. They're going to be very competitive as they were in the past. And they're the ones who are the you know, sophisticated players in the performance marketing area. So I don't think it's going to change a great deal there since the, the people who have been, we've been competing against the past are going to be the same people going forward. So I don't see significant change in that area. In terms of the P&L, when we get to that place down the road, that shining sun where we have fully recovered, I hope to be doing what we did in the past is have the leading margins in the industry and still growing nicely. And that's about the best one can, can put forward in terms of a long-term prediction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Your next response is from Doug Amon of JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Dave Young for Doug. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, so first one, um, can you talk about your business travel mix, what the mix was going into COVID-19, and do you have any data that suggests maybe um, business is helping recovery in some of the markets where you are seeing some? And then in those markets where you are seeing some pickup in demand, are those countries recovering in a similar manner? Just looking to see if the timeline in those countries can help educate us on how other country recoveries might look like going forward. So why don't I take the latter one, or take the, the, the former one? You know, one of the things I think is, is somewhat um, – I think it's something that can be deceiving in terms of trying to take what has happened in one country and then model – outcomes uh, everywhere else. And we've seen a little bit of uh, cases where countries have begun to open up, they're doing better, but then because they opened up on uh, uh, the economy, there's a resurgence in infection, and then they put in the uh, reinstatement of the restrictions, and things go backwards. Um, and I think it's, it's hard to do that. And also, you have different countries that have different travel um, patterns it also, so I definitely would not. I definitely would not take what is happening in one and then apply that across the entire world and say, okay, that's how this is going to roll out. I think that'd be a, a chance to come up with a very bad prediction for the future. And David, in terms of the first question, yeah, I mean, nothing really. No major updates on business travel. As we don't have a formal, um, a formal percentage. We have a, a self-declared. Um, estimate that maybe as much as a fifth of our business might be business travel, but it's not an audited number. It's not a number that we really track or spend a lot of time looking at. It's basically just a self-declared booking field. Um, what I would say is, and obviously, as Glenn said, we're just talking about very small deviations. We're trying to give as much color as we can for what we saw in uh, April. What, what I will tell you, and it's pretty obvious, that our uh, domestic uh, business uh, was uh, rates, you know, grew, you know, appreciably faster than the international race. And to the extent that uh, uh, business travel was international, that's still very depressed. Uh, I'm not saying that a large piece of it is, but obviously a chunk of it is. Um, so that's another way to look at it. But we don't really have any specific data for the month of April on what happened to business travel versus uh, non-business travel, other than the fact that we know what happened to uh, domestic versus international. Got it. Thank you, both. Thank you. Your next response is from Stephen Jew of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Learning and experimenting to merchandise better to the customer and, you know, connected travel have been themes you've been talking about for some time now. Uh, but with the demand environment being what it is, um, does that slow down the product development team in terms of the ability to innovate? because I guess there's a comparative lack of data and consumer behavior. And I guess um, your competitors are probably struggling with the same difficult circumstances as well. But strictly as you think about what you wanted to achieve uh, for booking in terms of product development and what, you know, the company looks like on the other side of the crisis. Thanks. You know, you're right. 
one of the things that's been a great advantage for us is our experimentation uh, ability because with more va with more data, we're able to come up with insights and be able to develop things much faster. And that's always been a, a great advantage for us. And if there's no demand, you're right, it's hard to put something in and say, is this working or not? How well does it work or not? So I, I agree with you that. But one can still make uh, uh, great insights with what, in comparison, is a small amount of data, but still can give you the insights. Don't forget, we were a lot smaller 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but we were able to come up with a lot of new things that were very valuable and helped make us a leader in innovation in this industry. And we believe that we'll still be able to do that. And the connected trip will still be going forward because we do believe and we are seeing, had, we're seeing data before COVID that was indicating we we're going in the right way. And I do believe that uh, this will continue going forward as demand comes back. Uh, we'll be able to do more and more with that data. Thank you. Thank you. Your next response is from Eric Sheridan of UBS. Please go ahead. One moment, please. Inventory longer term, Glenn. You know, any views about how supply might consolidate uh, on the other side of COVID-19 just because of the benefits of needing scale versus some of the historical trends, which could be quite a positive for the OTAs as demand is needed and demand starts to pick up. You know, it, it, you know looking back at past periods, the OTAs tend to take share uh, and tend to be a better partner for the hotel industry. So just curious about the relationship with supply and how you yourself see supply evolving over the long term on the other side of COVID-19. Thanks so much, guys. In the long run, in the very long run, uh, there'll be supply that will be to measure it with what it was before COVID, and it will match up with what the demand is in the long run. There may be, there may be, in the period uh, right now going forward or going through this recovery, that there may be some uh, decline in some areas of supply that just isn't as great uh, a place to stay, and therefore the demand doesn't go there and prices have adjusted that the better quality places are a little bit cheaper and people will go gravitate there. But here's the point. The buildings don't disappear. The hotel business doesn't, you know, it, it, the building there, it, it, if there's demand, it will get filled. Now, maybe a new owner, it may be recapitalized and such, but it will it will be there. So I, I think in the long run, I am not concerned about a constraint on supply that impacts our ability to provide great value to the uh, uh, consumer at all, or a chance that the supplier doesn't need us anymore. I don't see that happening at all. Thank you. Your next response is from Deepak Mathavadan of Barclays. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the questions. Glenn, how would you characterize, you know, your answer to the previous question on the alternative accommodation side? I mean, alternative accommodations has a great mix of inventory from urban apartments to, you know, with traditional vacation renters and also, you know, people like uh, uh, hosts that are using their second homes. Have you seen any meaningful disruption on that side? Is that, you know, something that's going to change meaningfully long term in your view? And then second question, I was also going to ask about your thoughts on investing behind brand. It feels like particularly in markets like U.S., you can invest on brand and then support it with some of the direct channels to capture meaningful share of the initial recovery demand. You know, what are your views on that? Thank you so much. Yeah, let me talk about the first one. We'll go back to the second one. So in terms of alternative accommodations, um, interesting question about will there be a decline in the supply because there's no demand right now for many of them and and they just say well i'm not going to bother with this one two is there an issue people are um decide this isn't a great thing to do because they're concerned about having strangers in their homes and just don't want to have that and how long does that go for you have also the trends beforehand about the regulatory environment does this uh issue of the pandemic increase uh, regulatory uh, restraints on the supply or not. Uh, the flip side of that is very interesting, of course, is where did uh, Airbnb and a lot of this business really come out of was the Great Recession 2008-2009, where a lot of people said, I need to get extra income, so I'll rent out my spare bedroom or something of that nature. Now, of course, it's morphed into a much more professional, I think. I think in the end, 
this is a good business for everybody. People like alternative accommodations. The people, the hosts, the people who own these properties, the people who are doing this cottage industries, they like it. It's good money, and as demand comes back, they'll continue to do it, and there will be supply to meet that demand. On the demand side, people, as you see right now, in just April alone, people see a need for it. I think that's good. I really don't see a lot of changes. You know, one of the things, and I'll just use your question to point to this, is that people think the world's going to be so different and I don't think the world's going to be hugely different once we get past this. There have been pandemics in the past, you know, go back 100 years, go back, Hong Kong flu, go back. There have been pandemics. There have been terrible things. But in the end, people want to travel. People are willing to supply accommodations. And I don't see that there's going to be a great change in, in, in the long run. And your other question was? Yeah, it was just on using brand advertising and supported with direct channels to capture a lot of the incremental demand during the initial recovery curve. Do you think that's something that's possible? How are you thinking about it, at least in certain markets like U.S., you know, where um, it feels like brand advertising can be more efficient initially? Well, we're talking with the whole marketing team about that. One of the things you don't want to be doing, the reason we're not brand advertising right now, is you don't want to be putting a message out when nobody's really listening or very few people are listening uh, to it and you're spending the money for the number of people who you're spreading this message to who really are not interested in traveling right now. That's not an efficient use of the money. I talked a little earlier about how we really want to be ROI uh, efficient in this. So I'm not sure, certainly when, we think that enough people are ready to travel, then it'd be good to start pushing that message out to them. The critical thing is, when is that right point? We'll be measuring uh, very carefully to see when that right time is. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your next response is from Justin Post to Bank of America. Please go ahead. Good to see you back. Um, two questions, and I apologize they have been asked, but First, thinking about your merchant platform today, much bigger than before, does that help you when people are ready to come back and hotels are engaging with different offers or pricing uh, or things like that? And then secondly, um, if you assume more people are going to travel in their own countries versus international, does that change anything for ADRs or your market share or your take rates? Thank you. Well, I do the first one. I'll do talk the second one. Uh, the merchant platform will be very important, and that's why we do believe it's something important for us to continue to invest in our payments product and get that out because, as you point out, uh, providing value, providing the right price, putting it together through that connected trip. That's one of the things we've talked about a lot. We still believe this is a great thing for consumers, really being able to put together different packages in a way. So, you know, paying one way, and is clearly one of the things, too, is us having more control over the cash makes it much easier if a refund is needed to be doing it for one thing instead of a customer having to deal with refunds from their air, from their hotel, from their car, maybe other things, that are the attractions they did, and all different people they talked to try and get refunds from. By doing it in one package, connected trip with us, through our merchant payment product platform, we'll be able to give much better value both in the time when they buy it and even if they have to deal with getting a refund. So that's more important. And, 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 and David, I'll let you talk about ADRs and what you think. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Justin. So um, historically, um, both ADRs and length of stay have been a little shorter for domestic travel because people's longer trips have been international, and therefore they've been uh, going towards higher ADRs and longer length of stay. Now, to the extent those international trips get moved back into the domestic marketplace, that distinction may actually not be as great um, because if the domestic marketplace was generally more short-term oriented and that mix shifts and it becomes more the place where people want to go for their longer may, major vacations, et cetera, uh, that may not be as big a factor as it was before, and there's really no difference in take rates. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Your next response is from Daniel Powell of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking the questions, uh, too, if I may. First is kind of to build on the question around timing of advertising and when you decide to, to sort of step back on the gas. I guess sort of what, what are you looking for um, to sort of indicate when, when would be a good time to step in? And, and what, what would your expectation be around ROIs if, if there's been somewhat of a vacuum created from um, hotels and, and other partners perhaps not being uh, as able or willing to spend when 
when things start to look a, bit, a little bit better. Um, and then the second question, you, you mentioned maintaining good relationships with your suppliers, wondering if you could you know, sort of give us a sense of, you know, during the global financial crisis, what, what did your relationships, what did your you know, access to inventory look like coming out of, of that environment versus you know, what you might expect in this one? Thanks. Sure. So regarding the brand advertising, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, forgive me for saying I, I'm not, I really don't want to give away exactly when we're going to put on the gas or what the signals are so our competitors can then, you know, get a, a jump on that. And I'm sure you'll understand that. It, look, it is important, though, for us to, to feel that we are going to be effective in using that brand advertising and going through it. And, and as the question earlier about there's a lot of things that we can do desktop now uh, and, and be able to put – out what is half video, uh, half um, half brand, and half performance through uh, video channels that you can start seeing some better response and a better sense of what your ROI is or not and be able, a little bit more selective in how you use that. And I think we're going to definitely be pushing that way. In regards to the supply relationships and the Great Recession as a model going forward, uh, we were very pleased uh, to see that, and, and this is why we feel comfortable and confident to talk about how uh, a deep recession can be helpful to distributors because in the past, the suppliers leaned in heavily into distributors who had demand for the obvious reason that, uh, you know, if you're a hotel and you're running a 40 or 30 percent occupancy rate, you need to get that demand and we're here to provide it to them. So that helps build that better relationship. And uh, I do think that's what we're going to see going forward. And I do agree. I think that some of them may not be doing as much brand advertising perhaps they were in the past, and that'd be due to cash constraints and other things where they need to make sure they're maintaining a certain amount of cash flow. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Your next response is from Lee Horowitz of Evacor ISI. Please go ahead. Great, and thanks for taking the question. Um, given the moves you guys have made with your balance sheet and shorting things up and obviously depressed uh, private and public evaluations, I'm wondering how you're thinking about your potential ability to be a um, acquirer of assets across the travel space during this crisis, given your strong balance sheet. Well, we like we always like having a strong balance sheet for many reasons, that being one of them. Um, and, of course, valuations, as we know, have changed drastically, but they've changed drastically for a reason. And certainly risk factor is significantly increased than it was a short time ago. So our, our way we approach acquiring assets or any type of acquisition is always the same, which is we measure in terms of what we'll add to our business for the franchise to help consumers and partners. What is it that's going to be great? What do we think of that in management? Do we think they're good? Do we think they can help us or not? And if not, can we operate this or will this add without that management team? This is something that we, we, we always we built our company through M&A, as you know, and we're going to continue to look out for that. But we, we recognize that this is a frothy time, and we have to be careful and picky in terms of what we do because the risk factors are much higher now. And, and, and David, do you want to talk anything more about um, the balance sheet? Or no. Okay. Nope. Okay. Okay. Our final question is from James Hardiman of Wedbush Securities. Hey. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. So, uh, really appreciate all the the data points uh, on March and April. Uh, obviously, somewhat limited, but. I wanted to take a step back. I was curious if you guys have done some consumer work. It seems like you're in a unique position to sort of understand what types of travel consumers are, are most likely to reengage in the soonest. Um, you know, obviously there's you know, air travel, hotels, restaurants, vacation homes, apartments, even car rental, all of which you guys have your, you know, a piece of. How are you thinking about which of those are, are, are most likely to resume normality uh, the quickest? Well, what we've seen is the hotel area, and, and they talked a little bit about what we've seen in that. A lot of air is still extremely limited, whether by government restrictions, allowing people to go to certain countries, or the amount of flights and times available. And people just general fearful about getting on a plane right now. And uh, you may have seen, for example, the Ryanair 
data that just came out in Europe, Ryanair is a good bellwether for air travel in Europe in April. It was essentially almost nothing, really almost nothing. And that's uh, unfortunately what we've seen in other parts of the world, extremely low amounts of air travel. But it's all will go somewhat together as people feel more comfortable about how their entire situation is. It's the vaccine we talk about. It's a treatment, perhaps. And it's also in their economic situation, all those things. So I think what we'll see is things start coming back. Yes, yeah, some things will be the other one. I think overall it will all come back pretty uh, very similar. Got it. And then last question for me, if I may. Uh, sounds like you're not quite ready to give any sort of a monthly cash burn number, just given some of the, the expense optimization that's still going on. But maybe walk us through some of the puts and takes. Um, you've got about a billion dollars of deferred merchant bookings. How quickly is that coming down? Uh, are there timing differences between when you provide refunds to customers versus when you're getting those refunds from the hotels? And then can you help us with an interest number given the, the transactions that's taking place as of late? Yeah, well, we uh, thank you, James. So this is the, I'll, I'll wrap up with this one. So, um, you know, we haven't given a cash flow projection for the year. We did give you an indication as to kind of what our cash position would look like at the end of 2021 uh, before we did our, our bond offering. And now, of course, we have, uh, you know, significantly $4.1 billion more than that. So we're not going to get to, to a monthly burn. Uh, I, I, we walked you through the the, uh, the changes to our, to our balance sheet for um, – you know, working capital uh, movements in Q1, those balances will continue to reduce uh, until we start to get travel demand occurring uh, once again. And I think the best way to handle this is once we've really gone through our optimization plans and we've decided where we're going to reset our cost base to, at that point in time, we'll give you more color as to uh, where we are. Um, I do not have an interest uh, rate number for you off the top of my head, but we can follow up with, with everybody and follow up with that one. Okay, fair enough. Appreciate it. Thank you. There are no further questions in the queue at this time. I'd like to turn the call back a little over to Glenn Fogel. Thank you. Now, I understand there was a technical difficulty, and uh, some of the last part of my uh, speed, my, my prepared remarks were cut off. And I think what's actually works out well, because the last two paragraphs, which I were actually are a nice way to close this off. So let me just close that off for everyone. Look, we know the progress against the pandemic is going to be disrupted at times as relaxation of social distancing in some geographies may lead to a resurgence of infections and a reinstatement of government restrictions. Our aim is to optimize the business to participate in the ultimate return of demand, manage our expenses in light of our best estimate of the shape of that return, invest in our business to build on our leadership position in the industry, and serve our customers, employees, and partners, and build shareholder value going forward. We have a tough road ahead of us. And we have been through many difficult decisions in the past, the last few weeks, and we're going to have some in the future, the weeks, the months, and quarters to come. The pay scale and impact of COVID-19 is unprecedented. But we know one day we will be on the other side. And we are doing everything we can to ensure we are well positioned to navigate through these challenging times. We have the confidence that with a highly variable cost structure, strong cash and liquidity, great global brand awareness, and some of the best people anywhere, we are well positioned to come out of this crisis and extend our leadership role in the global travel ecosystem. Now, I'm going to close by giving a heartfelt thank you to all the employees, our customers, our partners, and our governments as we work through these difficult days together. And to our employees, I have never been more proud of you and your enormous efforts to support our customers, partners, everywhere. We know there will be more tough days ahead, not just for us, but for so many people and industries all over the world. But I am confident we will get through it. And lastly, I want to say thank you to all the frontline workers out there, the doctors and nurses, the scientists trying to come up with a cure or a vaccine, the delivery people, and the people making sure there will be food in the stores, basically to everybody in the job that is designated as critical. To all of you working night and day to help our world get through this, thank you from all of us at Booking Holdings. Good night. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Have a good day.